Hello, everyone. I'm Gordon Arazza from Children's Hospital Los Angeles. It is a great pleasure to be presenting in my favorite meeting, uh, which I'm sure will be fantastic even in this virtual digital form. I will be talking about unusual abnormality in B lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, known as a PEX5 intergenic amplification or PEX5 intergenic tandem duplication. As it often happens, our interest in this genetic abnormality started from a clinical case. The patient was a two-year-old, previously healthy boy, diagnosed with B lymphoblastic leukemia. And because he presented with very high white blood cell count, his disease was classified as being high risk. We did very comprehensive genetic workup consisting of karyotype analysis, fish panel testing, chromosomal microarray analysis, and next generation sequencing using our custom panel for pediatric cancers. However, we were still unable to detect, a, uh, detect any primary genetic driver associated with known genetic subtypes of BLL. However, CMA showed unusual abnormality in the short arm of chromosome 9. There appeared to be two extra copies of a 51 KB segment, uh, which included 5' prime end of the PEX5 gene. Uh, and it appeared that exons 1 to 5 were incorporated in this copy number gain. At first, we thought that this was secondary nonspecific abnormality because PEX5 abnormalities are common in BLL. However, quick literature search showed that uh, this abnormality had been described previously as PEX5 intergenic amplification by two European groups, which studied this abnormality by MLPA. So what they described was that uh, this abnormality was um, occurring in BLL in one to 3% of the cases. Uh, typically, copy number gain involved exon two to five as mapped by MLPA, and they were able to show by FISH that uh, this was mapping within PAX5 locus, so it was not insertion somewhere else in the genome. Interestingly, uh, this abnormality seemed mutually exclusive of other major drivers uh, that define genetic subtypes of BLL, so they hypothesized that this abnormality may be associated with novel subgroup of BLL. The only exception was P2RY8CRLF2 fusion, which was seen in 10% of the cases um, of, with PAX5 amplification. Uh, however, this fusion can itself be both primary abnormality in pH uh, like a CRLF2 positive BLL. It can also occur as secondary abnormality in different genetic subtypes of BLL. So it was unclear uh, that, uh, whether the presence of this fusion indicates that PAX5 intergenic amplification was primary or secondary change uh, in those cases. And finally, they did some clinical correlations, and it appeared that this abnormality was associated with high-risk disease. Fast forward uh, to 2019, when genomic studies defined a new BLL subtype, which had unique expression signature, and was characterized by diverse PEX5 alterations, abnormal fusions, missense mutations, copy number changes. And so they named this new subtype of BLL PEX5 altered or PEX5 alt. And in one of the studies dedicated to PEX5 alt BLL, they found 10 cases of PEX5 amplification, of which eight were confirmed to have PEX5 alt um, expression signature. They were confirmed and classified as PEX5 alt. So now one can hypothesize that this abnormality may be one of the primary genetic drivers in this new PEX5 alt subtype of BLL. So after reviewing all this information, we realized that this was unusual abnormality, uh, which was still poorly understood. Uh, so we decided it would be interesting to look into this abnormality in our population of patients. So I will be telling you today about a study uh, which was done with the objective to determine the prevalence, structure, associated genetic changes, and clinical correlations of the PAX5 amplification in our cohort of more than 200 BLL patients. And we were detecting this abnormality by chromosomal microarray. In terms of the prevalence, we found five cases of PEX5 intergenic amplification out of 228 cases, so for a prevalence of 2%. And these five cases are shown here as they were detected by chromosomal microarray. We were able to get some limited information about the structure of this abnormality from CMA. For example, the size was approximately 25 kb. Uh, and um, it, it typically included exons two to five, uh, with the exception of one case where it was larger and included um, exon one. Um, and it appeared by CMA that there were two extra copies of the multiplied region for the total number of four copies in the genome. But with the caveat that and this was done on the case on the samples that had some normal cells as well, they were not 100% blasts. 
so we still had uh, additional questions uh, about structure of this abnormality. We wanted to confirm that it really localizes in the Pax5 locus, that these additional copies are within Pax5, uh, as the, uh, shown previously by fish studies. We wanted to check orientation of these extra copies um, and to accurately determine the number of uh, uh, additional copies of this gained region. So we decided that um, probably the optimal um, technique to get more information about the structure uh, would be uh, optical mapping, because we hypothesized that it will allow us to directly visualize the structure of that entire region within long DNA molecules, uh, rather than trying to deduce the structure um, indirectly if we were to use some other approach. So you're probably familiar with the principles of optical mapping, but just very briefly, it uses high molecular weight DNA, which get label, gets labeled at specific sequences across the entire genome. And then those long molecules are loaded on the instrument, which will linearize and stretch them so that the pattern of labeling can be uh, imaged. And, and those patterns and overlapping molecules um, are assembled, you know, based on those patterns, overlapping molecules are assembled into context, which then can be compar uh, compared to the reference. Yeah, and the differences can be used um, to uh, uh, identify structural changes in the sample of interest, whether they are copy number changes or balanced rearrangements. So we were able to perform optical mapping on two out of five samples uh, with PAX5 amplification that we identified, um, because for the remaining three samples, we unfortunately did not have residual material to iso isolate high molecular weight DNA. So I will be showing you results of optical mapping for two cases. These are results for case one. On the top, this blue bar represents reference, um, and this blue bar represents the uh, abnormal mutant allele. And you can appreciate that the, uh, within the expanded region, uh, there are four copies of the same pattern that is, is uh, being repeated in tandem. So this corresponds to four extra copies of the multiplied region in direct orientation. And this was surprising to us because a CMA was consistent with two extra copies. However, we did have confirmation from uh, doing size analysis. And the size of the expanded region uh, was measured uh, to be 85 KB approximately. And that corresponds to four copies of approximately 21 KB uh, region. And from CMA studies, uh, we knew that for this particular case, the size of the copy number gain was 21 KB. The results were even more surprising for the second case, uh, where in the expanded region, uh, we could see five extra copies of the same region, uh, showing the same pattern, uh, repeated in tandem. Uh, so here, uh, optical mapping uh, showed that, that, uh, that the exact copy number is five. And we again had confirmation from uh, looking at the size uh, because uh, the size of the insertion was here measured at 135, uh, which corresponds to five copies of about 27 KB region. And again, from original CMA studies, we knew that in this particular case, the size of the copy number gain was 27 KB. So interestingly, in both uh, cases, a copy number was significantly underestimated by CMA. And that showed to us how important it will be to study uh, these cases by method that can accurately determine copy number and accurately uh, show the structure of this um, um, a multiplied region. Uh, so we are hoping in the future to test additional cases by optical mapping. This slide is just showing concordance between uh, CMA and optical mapping in, in determination of other copy number changes um, in the uh, second sample, uh, with both techniques showing loss of the chromosome 9, uh, gain of the X chromosome, biallelic CDKN2A, and CDKN2B loss. So now that we verified that uh, extra copies were inserted in tandem uh, in direct orientation, uh, we could confirm that this insertion, these insertions are predicted to be in frame. If we look at the junction between exon, two and ex exon 5 and exon 2 at the mRNA level after splicing, at the junction it is predicted that there will be additional glycine codon um, uh, created and the message will stay in frame. So the abnormality is predicted not to truncate the, pro the gene and the protein, uh, but um, to result in um, 
in the formation of the altered protein of an altered protein. And, and since uh, copy number gain included typically exons two to five, and um, these uh, which code exactly for the DNA binding or pair domain of the PEX5 protein, and um, it is predicted that these extra copies will result in a protein that will have extra copies of the DNA binding domain. So it's easy to imagine that that will dramatically change the function of the PEX5 protein uh, binding to its target uh, and downstream regulation. In terms of the concurrent genetic abnormalities, in our five cases, three cases did not have any primary genetic drivers that we could identify that would be associated with primary genetic subtypes of BLL. And then in two cases, we, we saw B2RY8 CRLF2 fusion. So our results were very similar to what was described previously by European group, uh, where this abnormality was either mutually exclusive with other genetic subtypes, or was showing a, 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 together with the P2RY8 CRLF2 fusion. And then finally, in terms of clinical correlations, um, yeah, we thought it was striking that out of five cases, three patients were uh, the, uh, diagnosed with high-risk disease and two patients experienced early relapse. So although we had a small number of cases and didn't do formal analysis, uh, but our data is suggestive that this abnormality may be associated with high-risk disease as described previously by the European group. So in conclusions uh, for our studies so far, uh, we, we saw that PEX5 intergenic amplification or intergenic tandem multiplication uh, was present in 2% of BLL cases in our cohort. Uh, it, it involved in majority of the cases exons two to five and optical mapping was consistent with either four or five extra copies of this region in direct orientation. Uh, the insertion is in frame and results in extra copies of the DNA binding domain in the PEX5 protein, at least uh, as predicted, based on genetic structure. Um, and it likely connect both as the primary driver, most likely associated with PEX5 alt BLL, but it also shows this uh, interesting and striking association with P2RY8 CRLF2 fusion. There are many remaining questions that we are hoping to address in future studies. For example, I think it would be very important to determine the number of copies in additional cases. It is quite possible that there is a, a, a range, but that there is also the minimal number that has to be present for this abnormality to be oncogenic. Uh, it will be interesting to study the mechanism of duplication in whether it's repeat mediated to understand why it keeps recurring in the independent BLL cases, uh, how it leads to oncogenesis, and what are the downstream consequences of, the, of having this PEX5 altered uh, protein, uh, altered PEX5 protein. And um, to understand, um, it would be important to understand the association of PEX5 alt BLL. Is this indeed one of the primary drivers um, in this disease subtype? And finally, I think it will be very interesting and fascinating to um, understand its striking synergism with P2RY8 CRLF2 fusion. So with that, I would like to thank everybody for your attention. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful colleagues at the Center for Personalized Medicine at CHLA. And my special thanks um, also go to a bio-nanogenomics team, in uh, particular Nick, Alex, Carl, and Sven, uh, who helped me to um, use optical mapping to study um, the, this uh, unusual abnormality. So thank you again. <laughs>